take a breath. <sighs> Almost immediately, I feel so much better. <laughs> I think this phrase, take a breath, has definitely been in the top five phrases we've heard this week here preparing for TEDx after several unspeakable expletives. When was the last time you thought about that when you took a deep breath? Was it last week, last a couple of hours ago, or maybe just right now with, with me? Most likely you did not think about because taking a breath is, is as natural and organic a response to stressful situations. And I'm a physical therapist. I, I work in New York City. And I think just getting to work every day, I know I probably deep breathe several times before I even get there. When I, my patients arrive, I can also sometimes, I can see it in their eyes. They walk in and I can see the stress of trying to get there, trying to deal with work, the boss, family, on top of an injury. And I find myself telling them, take a breath. Without that, I know that we cannot get anything done. So it took, though, a time where I just did not necessarily respect or recognize the power of breathing. It took a moment in my life when I almost lost my job um, and another moment where I needed to hold my arms over my head for 11 minutes for 33 days in a row. These moments made me recognize and decide that I need to pay attention. What is going on behind this? There is definitely something more to this than just getting oxygen. So what I discovered and what I learned is what I would like to share with you here today, the power behind taking a breath. Um, it is important to um, understand the mechanics of breathing. In order to do that, we need to really know about the muscle that actually helps us do that. And that is the respiratory diaphragm. The diaphragm uh, takes care of, actually, um, how many people actually know where their diaphragm is or what it might even look like? Um, don't be shy, it's, uh, it's not as like, um, yes, good. <laughs> it's not as obvious as a bicep or a thigh. Uh, it is actually, because it is deep, it is in the center of your body. It actually divides your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity. It is um, attached by the, via a central tendon in, into your lumbar spine. And then this dome actually fans out and attaches to the ribs on either side. When we inhale, that dome actually implodes downwards. Then it meets up against the abdominal cavity and the edges can't have to now pick up the, the ribs and lifting us upward, outward, expanding the space in the thoracic cavity, air comes in. When we exhale, we simply relax and the di diaphragm implodes upwards into the thoracic cavity. The diaphragm completes two thirds of the work of breathing. When we need more oxygen, we employ also accessory muscles of the neck and the shoulders. They give us an additional superior expansion. Regardless, breathing is so cool, you actually possess a 3D muscle that moves your body in 3D and creates and modulates pressure from above and below and allows you to do the things you'd like to do. So what kind of a breather do you think you are? I actually invite you now to sit up a little taller in your seat, and um, we're gonna actually try this out. Check it out. 
I'd like you to put your one hand on top of your chest and one hand right over your belly. Good. We're going to take a nice gentle breath in. Exhale. Once again, gentle breath in. Exhale. Notice what your hands are doing. Now, if you feel the bottom hand moving, you're probably using your diaphragm pretty well. If you don't feel the bottom hand moving, you see, feel mostly the top hand moving, you're probably using less of the diaphragm and a lot more of those accessory muscles, which is probably why your upper traps get tight. If you don't feel either one of those hands moving, I'd like someone to call emergency services. <laughs> so, not unlike many other physical therapists, I went into this profession because I wanted to fix myself. Um, my first profession was dance. I had a spine injury. And being um, in New York and a dancer and you don't always have health insurance. You don't get access to a lot of help. So I had to help myself. And I learned everything I could about strengthening my core, because I knew that that would definitely help me stabilize my spine. And in result, I um, learned all these different things. I even became a Pilates instructor. But I realized there, there was even more. So. I couldn't get to a physical therapist, so I just became a physical therapist. This was, uh, there was the added benefit of when I got into physical therapy school, we were charged with um, designing a thesis. And in this thesis, um, I, of course, chose the question of what is the core. Buried underneath a whole rabbit hole of research and literature review, I finally settled upon a model of trunk control set up by Punjabi that separates the trunk musculature into local and global muscles. We need both systems in order to um, create a, a, an exquisite amount of um, trunk control. The problem in when the, with back pain is that often that deep system, that local system, turns off or shuts down. And that is the system we need to focus on. That is the system that the diaphragm is a part of. The diaphragm is from above, pelvic floor from underneath, transverse abdominis, you've got your pontifidus in the back. The diaphragm is a key muscle in this group because it is the activator. As that uh, diaphragm presses down and it press increases the intra-abdominal pressure, it puts a stretch on all the other muscles. And just like a rubber band needs to be stretched a little bit so it can shoot across the room, so does your deep core muscles. You need to stretch them a little. But there is another obstacle to rehabilitating back pain, and that is pain itself, because pain is stressful and stress alters breathing. Diaphragm is actually innervated not just by a motor nerve, but also a sensory nerve that comes from the medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata is our brain stem. It is dedicated to the involuntary processes in our body like heart rate and breath and digestion and endocrine release. And from the top, it is connected down via the vagus nerve to the diaphragm. The involuntary responses are regulated by that autonomic nervous system. When we, the medulla will send stimuli up to the brain, the brain interprets that from all those other systems and says, ah, do we need to go up or do we need to go down? Do we need to breathe faster? Is there something in concern here that we would need to either fight or flight? Or we can just go home and, and have some dinner. Now, unique in the diaphragm out of those other involuntary systems is that we actually can have voluntary control over it, or and that is what's called conscious breathing. And this is important because voluntary, we can feel and then respond. We sense a situation and we take a breath. We can employ conscious breathing. This makes the diaphragm sensory. 
and important because that is what pr connects our body, brain together. There was a moment when I, uh, uh, there's, what I want to say is that it actually takes being a patient to really understand your patients. And in 2013, I underwent treatment for breast cancer. Part of that treatment was radiation. So after all surgeries, beginning radiation, I needed to maintain this position and absolutely still not moving a single muscle. Every morning for 33 days in a row, I would go to a room <coughs> that <coughs> where I needed to be completely naked and arms overhead, and this position was excruciating after all the different surgeries. On top of it, the machine itself was this massive metal arm that crossed me from the right to the left over the course of 11 minutes, blasting in very regular increments. And if you've ever been in an MRI machine, you know that this is I'm telling you, this is pretty much close to that. And I sought all sorts of imagery and things that I could possibly do to deal with this situation and make it tolerable. But I was in it. There was nothing more I could do. So I thought, at least maybe I could drown out the sound of this machine, and that would take one stressor off of this situation. So I began to use like an o a yoga om. It would have been, so I would sit there and om, and I would, could hear that I could uh, match the sound of the machine and actually drown it out. Also helped me, I realized I could memorize the whole pattern, and I knew exactly when 11 minutes was over. Oh, um, for three counts, four counts, five counts, seven, seven, five, three, three, five, seven, and five. I can still remember it. What took me by surprise as just a last ditch effort is that actually by the fifth day, this was completely doable. The technicians were amazed that I also, my heart rate was down and my blood pressure was lower than when I went in, which is usually not the case. So again, my investigatory brain and my wannabe research PT wanted to find out what was really going on. Was it just, wasn't some just yoga magic? Is there something really physiological right behind all of that? And <clears throat> again, going through several studies, one that I did find that did not, that separated itself from most other studies that really only measure emotional responses to breathing was finally one that had very concrete neurophysiological parameters. In 2017, the effect of diaphragmatic breathing on attention uh, study measured three parameters and tested these before and after the subjects performed 20 minutes of, of deep breathing. Neural activity using an FR, um, MRI, which measures basically blood flow in the brain, heightened, um, excited situation. The picture will look all totally red. Uh, levels of cortisol. Cortisol is an excellent indicator of stress in our body. And to measure attention, they used a cognitive processing exam. In all three cases, these indicators were ex significantly changed. Here is maybe the start of some proof that breathing really does change the brain. And it could possibly be even more powerful than 
any pharmaceutical. So I was not actually breathing in that MRI, in that radiation. I was sing, I was humming, right? So I, does it count? Yes. As a matter of fact, when you sing and you vocalize, that is the only time you actively are exercising your diaphragm. So I'd actually like you to now maybe sit up a little taller one more time so we can all exercise our diaphragm together. We're going to do a ohm all together. I will start, and then you can kind of hum in. <clears throat> Take a gentle breath in. Om. One more, two more. Om. Nice, now that's the singing nation, I know. One more ohm for the light. Om. <sighs> so, these experiences taught me so much and changed me. It changed how I practice medicine, how I look at my patients, but mostly it changed how I look at any situation that seems unavoidable, stressful and undoable. And I hope that perhaps now today after hearing a couple of these suggestions and knowing more about what's behind taking a breath, you can also take control of your body and your mind. So I invite you now to simply take a breath. Thank you. <laughs> 